Hello, welcome to the first panel of the second international conference on policy fusion and development uh, and co cooperation. We are the panel 16, Latin America and policy fusion. Thank you for joining us and participating in this conversation around policy fusion in our region. We have three papers about cases of circulation of health, legalization of drugs, and tax reform policies. I would like to thank our three participants, which are going to present the work today, Asbel Bojías and Xavier Fernández y Marín, Flavia Cedin Costa, and Florencia Lorenzo. In addition, Dr. Uh, Raúl Pacheco Vega, I, I would like to thank you for accepting to be part of this uh, in his role of discussion. I am sure that we will really enjoy your comments. I would like to inform you uh, the dynamic of the panel. Each participant has two mi uh, 10 minutes, I'm sorry, to present uh, her his paper. After that, uh, Raul is going to share his comment with us. Following that, we will pick up questions from the audience. Please uh, feel free to ask uh, questions to some of the participants or some comments to Raul. Finally, we have time for final comments or answers from the participants in the same order and from Raul. That's the, the words we are going to uh, develop our panel today. Then we are going to start with our first um, paper. Um, the title is The Terminant of Elite Support for Drug Legalization in Latin America. Asbel Bajigues uh, is going to present the main author with uh, Xavier Fernandez y Marín. Asbel, you can start with your presentation. Thank you, Cecilia. I will now share my screen for the presentation. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Cecilia and Raul, for your uh, for the in the for organizing this panel in this uh, conference, and uh, in this paper with Xavier Fernandez de Marin, we analyze or try to explain why elites would uh, support drug legalization in Latin America, with a special focus on the influence of the state capacities in this elite support. First of all, drug legalization is one among many drug uh, policies. Uh, although it's true, we've seen a rise in support in the recent years for this uh, legalization in US states, for instance, or the case of Uruguay with marijuana. The interesting part here is that in Latin America, drug legalization, if any, of course, is top-down, meaning the efforts have been made from elites, not from a wide popular support. Uh, as a consequence, we focus in this paper on the top part, on elite support for drug legalization. We argue we believe that the strength of the state, meaning the effectiveness and the ability to enforce legislation, will affect how elites that are concerned with drug trafficking, allegedly elites that would be interesting in legalizing drugs as a solution, how they perceive this actual real drug legalization as a solution in, with the current state uh, of the country. Uh, to do so for the model, we use uh, individual level and country level data. For individual level, we explore the four main uh, theories in uh, drug uh, support for drug legalization. First, social demographics, gender, age, status, income, for political socialization or attitudes, we include ideology, religiosity, religious denomination, and approval of the military. Third 
in attitudes toward the policy, we include the concern of elites over insecurity and drug trafficking as national problems. And unfortunately, we cannot test the self-interest theory because we do not have data for uh, drug use of elites. This for the individual level. For the country level, we include a number of uh, variables, democracy, GDP per capita, infant mortality rate, homicide, education, government effectiveness, and public opinion, perceptions of insecurity, and the belief that organized crime and drug traffickers are um, the greatest threat to their security. To, we rely on elite service, as I said, from the Latin American elites database from the University of Salamanca, the PELA service, which gathers service questionnaires administered via face-to-face -face anonymous interviews to Latin American legislators for over 20 years. Specifically, we use this question that is asked to uh, MPs. How strongly do you approve or disapprove the, of the legalization of drugs? Generally, drugs, not marijuana or any other specific drug. Although the response scale ranges from one to 10, from strongly disapprove to, to strongly approve, we see that almost half of the legislators uh, strongly disapprove, meaning that they uh, support one in this scale. We this decided to dichotomize this original variable to a dummy uh, one. The first option, full provision, value one, uh, and values from 10 to 2 to 10, sorry, are, would be open to legalization. Again, it's, it's a question on drugs, generally. And for the model, we use a Bayesian hierarchical logistic analysis. These are the countries, years, and the num number of uh, legislators interviewed. We include all uh, studies that had in the questionnaire the drug legalization question. And we have a, a total of almost 2,000 MPs for over nine years for 18 countries, all Latin American uh, democracies. Uh, as for the individual uh, effects for drug legalization for this dummy variable, full prohibition or open to legalization, we can see here the key individual level uh, factors explaining. Uh, religiosity, military, age, ideology, levels of income. We see in black uh, individual variables that have uh, shared associations by countries and in gray non-varying variables, meaning that the effect is the same for all countries. However, we are more interested, as I said, not on the individual effects which have been studied by previous works, but how the context, the actual context of drug legalization might affect levels of support and the slopes for the individual level variables. Among all the possible combinations and influences for these six main individual variables for all the control level uh, factors I explained before, we only find uh, two combinations that appear to be significant. That would be health and government effectiveness over the concern of elites on drug trafficking. It is the only context effect on the varying slopes at the individual level, again, we see. So to uh, try to summarize the, the results. At the individual level, we see income has a positive effect, no surprise. Negative effect for age, support for the military, religiosity, and ideology, right ideology, 
Again, this comes as no surprise according to previous work. However, we do find, and this is the main contribution of the paper, a context mediation of government effectiveness and health issues on concern over drug trafficking. This means that when the government is not effective and there are health problems, the concern over drug trafficking, over drug traffickers, has a negative association with drug legalization, which means there is a lack of trust by legislators on drug legalization as an actual solution. Put it simple, if the state is currently not effective in policy implementation, why would that be different in the event of drug legalization? Thus, the four main contributions of the paper is uh, first, we work with empirical evidence of elites support in the top in a top-down region. We focus on the top. Uh, we uh, address six, 18 sorry countries. Usually, studies on drug legalization have addressed one, two, three countries. Three, we um, analyze support for drug legalization, not marijuana legalization. is a wider scope. And fourth, we provide some insights for advocates of uh, drug legalization, how to frame strategies, how to campaign, even to lobby. Again, we work with elite service in a top-down uh, drug legalization region. Just to conclude, uh, the main finding, elites will not support drug legalization in weak states. If those elites, those legislators, representatives who are concerned with drug trafficking, therefore we might think interested in finding a solution because they are concerned, they think it is a national problem. If they see, if they perceive that the current state, the current government has problems in policy implementation and in fact has some health issues, they will unlikely support a challenging and complex policy as drug legalization is. The first step for advocates and activists of drug legalization would be to request an improvement of government effectiveness and the outcomes in uh, public health. Before drug legalization, we would need stronger states, more uh, effective in policy implementation and results. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Asbel, for your presentation. Thank you very much for your for your for coming your our, your results uh, with us. We're going to continue uh, with the second paper that we have for in our panel. This is um, Global Health and Regional Integration Policy Diffusion uh, Within the South America Respond to the Zika Virus Emergency. Um, Flavia Tedin Costa Buena. Flavia, you can continue with your paper. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, um, I'm going to share my screen, just one second. Oops. Great. Um, so this is um, a paper I've wrote, and this is part of my PhD uh, thesis I defended last year at USP. Um, and this is a brief um, presentation of the content of this presentation. So um, the, the Zika virus emergency was the first uh, public health of uh, emergence of international concern in South America. And just for the context, so in May 2015, the, they first detected the Zika virus in Brazil. And in, by the end of the year, there are lots of 
uh, cases of microcephaly, especially in the northeast of the country. So at first it was considered a light dengue, um, and then um, the scientists called it the Zika virus con congenital syndrome, the disease that it was causing. Um, so uh, in Brazil, there was this context of political and economic crisis at the time, which led to the impeachment of President Dilma and the rise of uh, the deputy uh, Michel Temer in August 2016. And in the region of South America, there was also an ideological spin. Uh, so more conservative governments took over. Um, and in Brazil, there's also a change uh, since uh, since especially Dilma to, through Temer and, and on, uh, in, the, in the centrality that South America was, was, um, was taking in this foreign policy, so it lost a bit of protagonism. Um, so in this, in this context, the expectation at the time was that a disease that was transmitted by a vector that circulates virtually all over the country and the continent and South America, um, there was a great possibility of international dissemination. And so um, within this, pro this process of regional integration, since the 2000s especially, um, it was expected that regional organizations would respond, would respond very expressively um, to an emergency of, of such uh, greatness. And especially international organizations in the health field, such as Pan the Pan American Health Organization, Mercosur, and UNOSUR. So, just a little bit uh, in the international health regulations. So, this is abiding when there is an emergency of this uh, greatness. So, uh, they implement the international health organization uh, regulations. Uh, the WHO um, has two international binding mechanisms, uh, and this is one of them. And it's basically a surveillance mechanism to uh, control, protect, and provide a public health response, and especially to avoid unnecessary interference with international traffic and trade. So it obliges countries, they are members of this, this instrument, to report serious public health events to the WHO, and also describes procedures that the organization must follow. Um, Within this framework, the, the countries, they have to develop basic skills and uh, WHO can, can use unofficial sources, such as the media, for example, uh, to uh, mm -hmm. declare a pike, uh, this emergency. And well, uh, basically there were six uh, pikes uh, until now. There are two current, currently going on, the, the wild poliovirus and the new coronavirus. And the, the IHR uh, brings benefits to the countries of being part of an international surveillance and response gear and always and also uh, oblige them uh, to have and to develop those basic capacities uh, to implement the regulation and also to notify the events they have within their territory. So um, this implies a structural changes and strengthening the health surveillance systems with the support from the WHO must uh, be, be put in place. So the objectives here are to verify if there was international circulation of public policies in this response, and also if there was original surveillance and response system in place. And I used uh, elements of the approach on international dissemination of public policies, mm -hmm. uh, bibliographic research and document data analysis, and also interviews with seven key informants. So um, I'm not going to go through that because they probably you all know uh, what I'm talking about. So just skip to the role of the international organizations in this dissemination, which is, has been um, studied uh, a little bit more in the past few years. So they are very important in this process because um, they promote lots of transnational space, spaces. They also places where decision makers communicate and, and also constitute the space for production, circulation, and to legitimize actually ideas, models, and instruments. They also cooperate and dispute um, within the international system uh, or its area of influence. And also um, 
they advocate for similar policies, for the implementation of similar pol policies in their member countries. Um, when it comes to international organizations, it's also important to talk about levels of governments, governance, and I use the Bomer and Paget um, UKs. Um, so they have three types, basically, the hierarchical, uh, which tends to be more supranational, the decisions and the policy diffusion and adoption. It's more vertical, but within this framework, they also have a milder uh, type of hierarchical governance. Uh, so countries have more uh, place to adapt those policies. The negotiated one, when they seek just common rules and policies by consensus or majority, and the facilitated one, when they coordinate and cooperate uh, through guidelines and models. So uh, when it comes to the results, I found two movements in the circulation and policy diffusion. So the first one is the circulation of the IHR. Um, and I created this framework, just um, I'm new to this methodology, so it, it would be easier for me to uh, explain and to understand exactly um, and how to present this. So uh, the circulation of the, the IHR was from Pajo and WHO to Brazil and also from Pajo and WHO to the regional organizations that were also in this study. So um, in terms of the institutional mechanism, um, there were lots of benefits of uh, adopting the, the regulation. So, uh, the non-compliance, the non-adoption implies that the country will be excluded from the surveillance system. And so this is actually a little coercive in a way. Um, they also receive um, international support to implement the IHR. Uh, uh, in the case of Brazil specifically, because of the political crisis, um, it was good in a way to uh, implement the IHR because it shifted the focus from the political crisis to the health emergency. And it was also an international demonstration of the strength of its surveillance system uh, because specifically of the Olympic Games that was going to take place that year. Um, and in terms of the regional organizations, we can see the implementation uh, of the IHR uh, through the, the institutions in a five-year plan of UNOSUR, they have a working group just on surveillance. And also the Mercosur has a specific commission just to implement uh, the IHR in the block. And it, it also played an important role in the elaboration of this instrument. Um, in terms of transnational spaces, FAHO presented and promoted lots um, the IHR in many places especially disseminating protocols and guidelines. And it was also uh, very um, very present, even in, 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 in meetings of other institutions such as Mercosur, they presented the regional South American um, uh, epidemiological situation. So they took the, the lead in this response. Um, as I said, they, they were very technically producing um, diagnostic parameters and clinical practice, etc. And PAHO was very, uh, is, very, is considered a very legitimate uh, in the health field institution. Uh, so it was pointed out as the most prominent in terms of regional organization uh, in this response. There was also um, a support coalition. So the the IHR itself has an endogenous structure to facilitate circulation because they have focal points in each member country. So, um, and also they had a situation room within the Ministry of Health, inside the Ministry of Health, and also helped to support the, the, the next um, case I'm going to present, which is the thesis that the causality of the, the, malgeni the malformations was the Zika virus. So there is also international pressure, as I said, because of the Olympics and the possibility of international transmission. And also in terms of South America, the possibility of dissemination within uh, the continent. Uh, there, were, there were lots of ambassadors of the IHR within the Brazilian government and also in Pajo that was working internally. And there are also disputes and tensions among the institutions, which we can see um, 
in this case was not very clear because um, Yunus was very weak at the time of this um, of this emergency. So in terms of um, governance, we can see that mild uh, part, that, that mild um, a type of governance, uh, of hierarchical government, because the IHR does not have sanctions for non-compliance uh, by its members. And the other one is the Brazilian thesis that the cause of the malgenital, the, the malformation, the congenital malformations was the Zika virus. So it's what, it was from Brazil to Pau and the rest of the world. So uh, lo lots of scientific institutions in Brazil proved in small cases initially that um, they were connected. So in the sense that the thesis of the causal relationship uh, was adopted in a rational involuntary way. So uh, because scientific data was proved, um, but there was also benefits on that because uh, the Brazilian government, for example, and the rest of the world could possibly could possibly have uh, take extraordinary measures by understanding this this causality and and making it an emergency, uh, take um, and increase the the the, the, the volume of resources, etc. And so to deny this thesis would be to deny all those benefits. So this thesis was promoted in lots of transnational spaces, in PAHO meetings, WHO meetings, in CELAC, and the International Olympic Committee. There are lots of institutions producing, um, producing knowledge to back, this, um, to back this, this thesis. And also, it was disseminated and promoted by Rene Zika, which is a network of scientists here in Brazil, and also by previously established network contacts from UNOSUR and Mercosur uh, from the epidemiological um, side of um, the cooperation. So lots of um, very important uh, Brazilian institutions promoted this, such as Fiocruz and the Institu Instituto Evandro Chagas, and also the, the recognition uh, right after that by the CDC, PAHO, WHO also legitimized this thesis. So um, although there was a crisis in Brazil, there was this um, political forces came together at this time to structure this, this uh, the measures to address the, the problem. And there was also international pressure uh, for, for understanding uh, the causality of the problem, especially uh, so so the world could understand that Brazil there was going to be the host of the Olympics, uh, understood what was going on here. Um, as the, the main ambassador was President Dilma Rousseff, and also we can see that many doctors uh, from uh, the Northeast understood what was going on and they decided to create a WhatsApp group. And so they also were very important to the, the dissemination and the, the legitimization of this thesis. Um, well, so final remarks, I'm sorry for the time. Uh, so we have identified those two dissemination movements. There was during the Pike Regional Epidemiological Surveillance Gearing Place operated by PAHO uh, and not for uh, not operated by UNOSUR and Mercosur. They had little involvement in the regional response to the emergency. The economic crisis, crisis and the response the resulting lack of funding have also contributed to the curbing of international and regional actions and projects to combat the Zika virus. So it also impacts very much the functioning of health system in the subcontinent. PAHO was considered very prominent, is the older, uh, it's more established and institutionalized in, in the region. So, and PAHO and WHO have great penetration in the field of health diplomacy and in, in, in the states and also, also have financial capacity and resource mobilization and technical support to the countries. Um, so despite this opportunity that was provided by the PIKE for the regional cooperation, for the projecting and positioning of the region in the regional scope, in the international scope, the blocks worked in the case of the Zika virus as more of operators and facilitators of the IHR circulation process and that Brazil was very successful in promoting the causal relations between Zika virus 
and the malformations leading an improved capacity to respond to tackle the problem um, at the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flavia, for, for your article. I think that's a very interesting case and your, your, result, your results <laughs> uh, give us a lot of questions about the role of international organizations. Many thanks for your paper. We're going to continue with the, our third uh, paper. The title is Taxing the Rich and the Powerful, a Comparative Exercise Based on Policy to Combat Tax Evasion in Three Latin American Countries by Florencia Lorenzo. Thank you, Florencia, you have your time. I'm going to try to share my screen. Can you see it? Are you able to see my screen? Uh, so, uh, in this paper, it, it originally encompassed uh, three countries, but I ended up removing one of the cases. So, um, my objective in it is to uh, formulate some tentative hypotheses on the engagement of Latin American countries uh, with international governance in a context of increased reforms, uh, a context that took place from 2009 on. Uh, I focus on only two countries um, and I try to analyze how the transformations in the international sphere interacted with domestic processes. So uh, international tax governance is a uh, issued again uh, a lot of political salience in the last couple of years due to a series of leaks such as the Panama Paper episodes and the Lux leaks. Uh, one, I mean, that there were several uh, episodes, including uh, a couple of them related to the role of multinationals in, in evading taxes. Uh, and it's a uh, it's a topic that goes back almost a hundred years ago when the first institutions to deal with international uh, tax interaction, interactions were developed within the scope of the League of Nations. Uh, at that moment, the main preoccupation was to deal with uh, double taxation. And the, when the League of Nations uh, stopped existing, the, the, topic, the main forum uh, of the topic was uh, moved to the OECD. Some of the key features of these institutions that, that deal with the interaction of countries in the, on taxations in the international sphere are connected uh, to two main dynamics. The first one, one of them is international double taxation so that the same income is subject to tax in two or more jurisdictions. And the other one of them is international tax competition where uh, countries interact in a matter that with to attract uh, mobile um, tax bases. And the key institutions of this regime or this legal order are bilateralism, so it's implemented through a network of uh, double taxation treaties. And two main principles uh, lie at the heart of uh, these institutions, the first one of which is the arm's length principle that states that for taxable purposes the different entities of the same multinational should be treated as uh, uh, separate and transactions within them should be addressed as if they were uh, conducted by a third party, non-related party, and the separate entity accounting principles through which uh, multinationals uh, related the, uh, uh, report their um, transactions uh, in each country. Uh, these institutions that were developed to deal with double taxation so that the same income would not be 
attacks twice in the same um, in different countries uh, they were later deemed responsible in a large matter for the issue of double tax avoidance and evasion uh, especially once that uh, financial flows increased so from the 70s on this phenomenon gained a lot of preeminence and with the rise of multinationals and so forth uh, during the 90s, so some reforms were, uh, uh, they tried to uh, implement a couple of reforms, the most famous of which is the harmful tax competition project by the OECD. But this was, was a failed uh, endeavor, uh, so the, they were not able to achieve significant reform. And for this reason, the literature uh, stressed how this regime was really path dependent and any reform occurred only on incremental basis. But then after the 2009 crisis, uh, a wide reform agenda was established within the OECD, focusing on the implementation of automatic exchange of information between tax administrations. Um, for tax purposes, uh, the BEPS project, uh, Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, which uh, sought to address some of the key flaws of the international tax rules so that multinationals would start paying taxes in, in certain jurisdictions. And all of this happened in the context of increased inclusivity. Uh, so the OECD, which historically suffered from a legitimacy uh, problem, democratic legitimacy problem, uh, started including uh, developing countries through uh, uh, several mechanisms. Uh, my, the focus of my paper, so I, I put an emphasis on Latin America as a whole, but two countries in partic particular, which are Brazil and Argentina. Uh, I try to um, focus on the region because I argue that many of the topics that were discussed within um, uh, the context of international tax reform, they resonate with uh, several political preoccupations in the region, such as the, uh, the, the ability of governments to regulate foreign multinationals. Uh, I, I try to show by analyzing uh, the development of domestic institutions and by analyzing uh, engagement in, in certain international fora, how they did so by aligning with international practice sometimes, uh, such practices which are centered at the OECD, but oftentimes by developing their own institutional solutions. Uh, one of the main examples is the development of the sixth method in Argentina, which is a method for uh, pricing internal transactions between related parties. So they will, would um, would not be able to evade taxes in a, so easily. And this is a method that, that the country usually defended as being uh, very important because of its level of simplification, which is a, 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 an important preoccupation for developing countries uh, that the, guide, the, the, the rules developed at the OECD are usually deemed to be too complicated for the context of the developing countries. However, in the, this context of increased inclusivity, I see, uh, I try to show in the paper, several uh, emerging tensions between uh, demands for um, broader participation and adherence to rules that for are uh, arguably biased in favor of developed countries. And uh, so I, I show in the paper various forms of engagement, uh, the development of autonomous solution and the diffusion of this solution, such as the uh, six method, the voicing of concerns and the politicization of the very forum where uh, international tax governance is being carried out. Uh, this was especially preeminent with the presidency of the G77 uh, by Ecuador and the increased uh, advocacy for the UN to assume a larger role in tax governance. Uh, this, um, this graph shows an, uh, the number of mentions of 
um, this term is uh, the general, general Assembly of the United Nations. So you can see that uh, after 2009, you, you have this theme, the, the, the discussions on tax havens gain more political saliences in international, in international quarter. And then uh, I try to, I'm going to go really fast here because I, I think we don't have much time, but I try to show how ideology, I, I, I argue that ideology played a, a, a large role on the adherence both to the forum, the OECDC, OECD, and uh, the institutions developed by this forum. So uh, both Argentina and Brazil had autonomous solutions, both, uh, simplified solutions to deal with tax uh, avoidance by, uh, by multinationals. And then uh, alterations in powers uh, had impacts on the alignment of the countries with the OECD uh, institutions. This happened both as Macri's presidency rose to power in Argentina and with the t arrival of the Temer administration and the, a process of increased um, politicization of the ascension to the OECD. So in some, these are uh, an effort to develop some tentative hypothesis on what guides adherence to these institutions or or divergence and but I guess that's about Thank you, Florencia, for your paper. Well, um, we have listened to the three papers, and now we are going to um, listen to the comments from our discussion. Uh, Raul Pacheco Vega. Raul, you have your time. We have around 20 uh, minutes for your comments, more or less. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Cecilia. I'm going to be brief because I I have it's really funny because uh, we criticize sometimes discussions for having you know more comments than questions. Um, I do have more questions than comments this time, and I wanted to first congratulate all three participants. This is such an honor to be uh, joining you in panel 16 policy diffusion in Latin America, particularly because this is really under theorized. It's really the, the kind of empirical work and theoretical work that we need to do is still underdone. I don't think we do enough. So I'm going to go briefly into each one of the three papers and I'm going to comment them um, first, you know, for their themes, because they're very different themes, drug legalization, Zika and, and campaigns against Zika, and then uh, the last paper on uh, tax evasion and international taxation and tax regulation. And for the first paper, I, I'm, I'm slightly surprised by the results. Huh? It's a really interesting paper on, on the role of elites uh, in, in the legalization of marijuana. And uh, it's a paper by um, Bojigas and, and Fernandez y Marin. Uh, it's strange because it doesn't read like a policy diffusion paper or policy transfer and so on. Um, and this may be for all sorts of reasons, but I, I mean, to to determine elite support and use policy transfer, policy diffusion theories, and so on, I would need to see sort of an empirical examination of how elite support occurred through time, which is not what you're presenting. What you're presenting is more uh, the the uh, the support of elites uh, to drug legalization and. I, I think one of the biggest problems, and, and this is a problem in political science particularly, is that I think we are, you are trying to do too much in one paper. I would be quite happy with a paper that focuses just mainly on, uh, you know, drug legalization and the role of ideas and, and, and the role of ideas of elites um in and the elite support in the legalization i 
actually think that by bringing state capacity, you're inserting confounders into the analysis. I, I'm also concerned that the method may or may not ca capture elite political behavior. So um, this is this is one, I do both mix, mixed methods. I do quantitative and qualitative, but this is a case where I would argue it's much easier to understand drug legalization or lack thereof uh, from a qualitative perspective to understand how different elites behave rather than trying to capture them in a quantitative manner. So I would have gone, I, as they say, you, you're, you're writing your paper, not the paper I would have written, but I, I would have definitely tried to see um, or maybe a mixed method approach where I would look at behavior, not only at a grander scale, like a comparative um, uh, regression analysis and, and hierarchical modeling, particularly Bayesian hierarchical modeling, which is what you're applying. It's, it's complex and sophisticated and, and can capture a, a broad variety of effects. But I would have probably supplemented with um, interviews. I think that's one of the things that I take away. This is not a criticism of the of the paper or, or the methodology. I think it's it's just, I think it's a great paper, but I think it's trying to do um, too much by in, involving state capacity as a, as a confounding. I think, um, you know, the main, it, the, the other contribution that I'm concerned about and that I would like to understand better is what's really so you you account for main theories of support for drug legalization but your bayesian hierarchical and logistical analysis um basically it, it tells me what it's supposed to do right like it it's telling me that yes higher income is associated with support uh for drug legalization so increase support so uh what is the surprise so this this is this is not a surprising result and and i would like to hear from you why it wouldn't be a surprising result so it's not it's confirming you know general perceptions rather than um you know something uh surprising so it's it's one my, my that would be my my first question why um on the second paper and the second paper is on um, the global health and regional integration in the South American response to the Zika emergency virus. It's also a super interesting uh, paper by Flavia. Um, and I'm again, <laughs> I, I see, I, I think these are papers that are trying to do a lot and I would like to see them a lot more streamlined. I would like to see what exactly is the main uh, mechanism. So you're involving IOs and you're involving other sorts of um, other different um, considerations of how there was support and 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 an activation of response to Zika. This is um, this would be the perfect paper. This, this contrary to the previous one, this would be the pe perfect paper to do in a more quantitative way. That is. You know, comparing a larger N, probably a medium N, set of responses to the Zika virus, and then go back to your comparative approach. Because in in that sense, um, I'm still not sure of, you know, whether or not we should have expected that IOs would have um, not intervened in the process. So. What I'm saying is this is a global epidemic issue. So it is normal that international organizations will have an impact on the response, right? So, so again, this is not surprising. My, my question more is what was surprising about what you found in your paper? It's again, it's a really good paper. It's not a criticism of the paper, but I think Again, it's trying to do too much by focusing on two countries in too much uh, on on two cases in in too much uh, detail. Um, even though you know most of the response focuses on 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 Brazil, um, and but it's it's still it could be done in a, in a much more streamed way, streamlined way, and you know particularly showcasing something that becomes a lot more surprising. And on the third paper, taxing, I, I love taxation. 
I hate taxing policy, taxation policy. I, I really hate it, but um, I love <laughs> policies against tax evasion. And I think that Florencia is doing a really good job at focusing on the the tax evasion in in um, in Latin America. As you said, you know, you you focus more on the um, Argentinian case. You you pay a lot more attention to the Argentinian case um, and and ideology, but Again, this, uh, to me, the methodology was not clear, right? So you could do process tracing to try to see how ideas diffuse into different countries, right? Or you could do something a la Covadonga Meseguer, you know, with larger end countries. But you're, the number of cases you're using is too low, right? Like it, you're primarily focusing from my read of your paper on, on Argentina, right? Uh, so it's it's really hard for me to discern really what the, the, the empirical strategy was here because it's a very rich, um, it's a very rich article in terms of historical detail, but it's not clear to me that you traced or that you conducted interviews and so on. So this is important. This is an important, I mean, tax evasion requires, you know, it, it involves some degree of illicit activity. And illicit activity is normally studied using ethnographic work. So I would like to know more about the method that you used in this in this research um, to understand the diffusion of policies. It, it looks to me like, you know, your, your argument is very much OECD, um, it's OECD comes into the, into the, um, it's sort of the main driver of the idea. It's not a surprise. OECD pushes for a lot of ideas. So, um, you know, in the, in my own research, the OECD has pushed for, uh, what are council governance in, in Mexico for water governance. So this is not a surprise to me. Again, this is the third paper I'm reading where the finding is not surprising. I would like to hear again from you. And this is a question, as you've noticed, that I posed to all three presenters. I mean, none of your results surprise me. And I would like to see what in it should be surprising to students of um, some of students of the of, of you know policy diffusion, policy transfer, and so on. So this this would be sort of my main comments and uh, I would like to hear from you in responses. And again, Cecilia, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to discuss such a group of excellent papers, okay? Hi. Um, uh, then, uh, well, first of all, thanks, uh, Raul. Um, for your comments and uh, suggestions, uh, I agree with all of them. For, for the first thing you said that we do too much in the paper, it's uh, true. But perhaps is that uh, this is an attitudes paper and not a public policy or drug policy paper, because actually we're working with public opinion from citizens and the lead. So perhaps that should be, we should work more on this framing of the paper, more on the attitudes part. And again, attitudes, because as you said, uh, we do not have data for behavior of MPs. One of the, the, the characteristics of the Pella Usal data uh, for this service is that they are anonymous. So we cannot see what these uh, individual MPs um, voted or not in other uh, areas uh, or in previous uh, laws that have been passed or not. We only have this uh, anonymous attitudes uh, data. Um, and finally, for the... Yeah, and your suggestion on using qualitative a more qualitative approach and uh, the use of interviews 
mm, it is in fact a good idea, but it would be, I think, uh, a little bit difficult to. I'm not sure how we would be able to do that in this paper. Perhaps for another, uh, for the whole project would be great, of course, and I appreciate the the observation. And just one final thing. Um, for the theories we test at the individual level, uh, I'm not sure I got your comment, but what I meant is that for the individual level, we do not find any different results from previous works. I mean, old theory said that income and education have a positive effect on uh, support for drug legalization, and we do find that on the elite uh, data. The main contribution, the, the main difference uh, would be uh, for this context uh, effects on the individual effects uh, of this uh, combination that I, I mentioned for uh, government effectiveness and health issues on concern over drug trafficking. Sorry if I, I, I was not clear on, on that. But again, I think that's all we do have to work more on the paper and try to improve the framing. But again, uh, thank you for your time and your comments. Right, uh, thank you very much, Ro, for your comments and for your time to, to evaluate our papers. And I do agree with you. <laughs> that I tried to do too much in this paper. Uh, it was very difficult to uh, go from a 300 pages thesis to, you know, a 10,000 word paper and in, an, in another language as well. So it was a bit of a challenge uh, to try to do it. And I do agree that I could uh, simplify it a little bit, a, a little bit more, um, maybe including, I don't know, the, the framework I I used to present the results because then I, th I think it is easier to, to see exactly what I'm talking about in the narrative. So um, I'll have this, I'll take it into consideration. Also, um, you asked me what was surprising in my findings. And of course, when we have this um, international emergency, uh, the regional organizations are expected to, you know, put a plan in forward and etc. But um, what I found is that um, there were basically three main uh, organizations working in the health field in South America, and only one was very prominent in that because of the IHR, of course, which was FAO. And Mercosur and Unasur, they were going th through uh, the crisis in Brazil also affected uh, the, the, the organizations because, for example, Brazil was not paying the fee uh, for Unasur and Brazil um, corresponded to, I think, Brazil, Brazilian fee corresponded to 40% of the general budget of the organization. So um, all of this... Um, um, made those organizations took a step uh, backwards and uh, just uh, help in a way that you know the oper the, the operation of the the instrument um, and also that UNOSUR and Mercosur they also have uh, the health councils and you know the 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 Ministry of Health meetings and etc. They have like how to say that instances that discuss and you know create public policies in health uh, and some of them are dedicated to surveillance or either as we, we said uh, in Mercos where they have a specific commission just to implement the, the international health regulations but they did very little in that and so this was um, one of the, the great findings, but I think the, the, the major contribution was, and maybe this was not very highlighted in the paper, uh, is that 
apart from the non response of those organizations, they have this legacy of communication between um, the focal point, the surveillance focal, focal points within South America. Uh, at this point, the South American Health Council uh, was not uh, meeting anymore and or meeting very little and the working group had uh, on surveillance of, of UNOSUR um, was stopped. They, it, it just, you know, um, did not have any meetings for, if I'm not mistaken, three years at that point. So even though they were not working properly, uh, the focal points and the network, they were able to communicate and to share. So they, we can say um, UNOSUR and Mercosur that have this legacy uh, in the region. We don't know uh, how much time it's going to last because as we can see, especially UNOSUR is you know, it's not working anymore. Um, and the South American Institute of Government in Health, uh, which was the, South, the, the Health Institute of UNOSUR in Rio, uh, closed its, its door in 2019. Um, so I think this, this would be, this legacy would be a great finding. And I did not understand, um, you, you talk about a more con quantitative approach, if I'm not, if I understood correctly. Uh, if you can talk a little bit more about this so I can understand a little bit uh, your contribution. And I think, I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you all for reading carefully our papers and I think your comments are really pertinent. Um, so um, about the methodology, I think this paper was a first approximation to uh, in which I wanted to uh, trace the different ways through which countries were interact, Latin American countries were interacting with international tax governance. But I do think that you uh, substantiate any explanation, I would would need to conduct the process tracing and and collect further evidence. I do think that uh, the main objective of this paper was to develop, uh, of my paper was to develop some tentative hypothesis because uh, most literature on, on international tax governance doesn't concede much uh, importance to the role of ideology. It's usually very focused on interest and power. So uh, there's a, there isn't much literature about uh, the role of ideology in divergence and convergence. And I wanted to try to highlight that. Although, um, and it, it, I, I expect to develop that into a PhD research project because right now I'm finishing my master dissertation on, on international tax governance. And I, I do think that I need further evidence for, to, to uh, maintain such claims. Um, and yes, I, I think, I'm not sure if there was Another question, I guess, the, the, but I guess the, the key point was methodology, and I, I certainly agree with the need to improve my methodological approach. Thank you very much to all presenters. I would like to now do a, a tiny bit of a rejoinder because I think it's one of those um, very few opportunities that we have. One of the main objectives that uh, Professor Osmani Porto, um, De Oliveira and, and Cecilia Osorio and myself, we've, I, I think we all are at the stage where, where we would like to mentor the up and coming um, the, the up and coming presenters and the up and coming um, scholars and writers and so on. So I, I want to just 
um, make a few remarks on, on the papers and your responses as a whole and, and uh, your responses to my comments. So uh, I think the first one that I, that I would like to make is that the, for, both for Abdel and for um, Florencia and uh, also for Flavia, I make an emphasis on the methodologies because there's already a debate. Professor um, Osorio, Professor Porto de Oliveira, and myself were in a, uh, in a conversation yesterday on how there are different methods to study policy diffusion, policy transfer, policy circulation, and so on. And one of the biggest challenges, I think, for the next generations, and you are the newer generations, I'm very excited to see that Florencia is planning to do her PhD, and this is very exciting. I'm, I'm actually quite impressed that she's now presenting at the um, at an international conference. See, she is just recently graduated from her undergrad, and she's just doing her master's. Um, and also Flavia just finished their, her, her PhD. So I think it will be up for the younger generations, for the up and coming generations, to push more on the methodological components. And just to clarify a little bit on, on the issue that I made both to, to Flavia and, and to um, Astel and, and also, well, to all three presenters, I think that quantitative approaches to the study of the diffusion of ideas are interesting, but they require to be complemented. So one intermediate approach would be to study a medium man, you know, 10, 12, 15, maybe countries, and then, you know, do some medium level analysis. There's, you know, QCA, there's a number of different medium range uh, level of analysis. But then there's the need to supplement. I mean, I don't think anybody can study policy convergence, policy diffusion, policy transfer, just with one method. That's, that's just, not possible. So I just wanted to re-emphasize why I was so adamant in pushing you all three to, to discuss the, the methodological component, because you, you are all sort of part of this new generation of scholars that we trust will be pushing the conversation forward, right? Like, And I also wanted to uh, acknowledge all three of you, because you are choosing really interesting research, right? Like, you know, drug legalization and tax evasion and um, epidemic response and pandemic response. So these are topics that need to be studied. And I do encourage you all. I, I really enjoyed your papers and I really think they were very well done. And I know that for many or all of you, uh, English is the second language. So it's really exciting to see you know, you pushing the boundaries and the frontiers. So I just wanted to thank you all again for writing these interesting papers and to Cecilia for inviting me to be the discussant. I think there's great promise in this work. Thank you, Raul, for your comments and for your questions and your insights. Um, and thank you, uh, thank you, Asbel, Flavia, Florencia, for your presentations and your answer to the comments from Raul. It was a very rich discussion with some challenging comments and topics that we should continue discussing for our research on policy fusion and transfer. Um, and thank you for the audience for listening today. And we expect to continue discussing in the following panel of this second conference on policy fusion. Uh, take care, stay safe, and I hope to see you personally in some future conference to all of you. Thank you very much for being with us. <laughs>